Welcome to the 10th episode of Vinyl and Celluloid, the podcast. Let me ask you something. Have you ever come up with an idea that you thought would make a great movie or TV show? Then you started to do some basic research and you're immediately put off by all the books, structures and rules that are required just to adapt your amazing idea to a standard format recognized throughout the industry? Well, hopefully today's guest will help you sort it out. Lena Mourizet is a, an emerging talent and one of the hottest names in Hollywood today. Originally from Switzerland, Lena has been based in LA since 2018 and sold her very first TV pilot within six months of completion. The pilot landed her a spot in the Coverfly's prestigious red list and she has multiple ongoing projects in the hands of major Hollywood agencies and producers. Stay tuned to listen to her amazing journey and advice to any aspiring creative. So, Lena, first of all, thank you so much for agreeing to be a guest on uh, this episode of the podcast. It's a bit of an unusual episode because I always there's always a specific topic, either a movie, a genre, or a type of songs. But here we're talking about actually a, a career. And I know I speak with a lot of people that uh, have tons of great ideas. Everybody has a great idea in their own head, I guess. <laughs> um, but they never actually make it past the idea stage so mm -hmm. I mean it's great to first of all I'll let you the chance to introduce yourself uh, and to start like when was the moment that you really decided this is it I want to be a screenwriter so first of all thank you so much for having me today I'm really really honored actually to be interviewed <laughs> by you I think it's it's awesome so thank you so much for having me uh, I hope we're gonna have people uh, listening to this and enjoying this uh, I'm gonna be as open that I can possibly be and, you know, give some tips and everything that I possibly can for other writers out there or filmmakers. So um, about me, I'm from Switzerland. I'm in a small town close to Geneva. So I'm more so on the French side, but I do write and speak in four languages. Um, and I have made a career in marketing and advertising back in Switzerland. Uh, and I was doing pretty good. I was also enjoying my, my job. I thought it was, you know, it was nice. So it wasn't like something that I hated. Um, but slowly <laughs> I um, discovered in, I think it was maybe December 2017. So it wasn't that long ago. I started to realize that screenwriting was a job. I've, I've always been into writing since I'm a kid. And I, you know, used to write more so novels because that's what I knew. I didn't know that screenwriting was a thing. Um, and eventually, I think it was around December 2017, I landed on a script from Shonda Rhimes, and I love all her shows. And I'm pretty sure she's listening to your podcast. So hi, Shonda. <laughs> um, so I love her. I really love her shows. And I like started reading that stuff, and it just made sense to me. I just I was reading it, and I was like, this is such an amazing way. Like I think scripts look so cool, and I love. I just felt like it spoke to me. So I started researching it online and started like, you know, um, taking a look at all those softwares and, and how you could write a script and like the rules or whatever, screenwriting, even though I don't really believe in rules. I'll tell you about it later. But that's pretty <laughs> much how, you know, that happened for me. And while I was working and, and having my career and getting a degree in marketing too, I was just writing from my bedroom and writing scripts. And I had no clue what I was doing. I didn't know what an outline was. I was just jumping in there, having fun. Um, and eventually I, I felt like, you know, I got some feedback from people here and there because you can reach out to so many people online now. And they were like, mm -hmm. you have really cool dialogue, you know, and I was still probably nothing really made sense. I'm scared to look at what I was writing back then. But, you know, they were like, you have cool dialogue. And, and I was thinking, oh, that's great. You know, and starting to look at those um, film schools and, and, you know, all those stuff out here in Los Angeles, because I knew I wanted to make it um, in Hollywood. I know the European market is amazing and I also want to be established there. But I, you know, have been watching films that are from Hollywood and like um, TV shows, especially. So I knew what stories this market wanted. And, and I was, you know, I knew about it. So I, I figured that I would take a look at all those schools. And I wanted a school that wasn't going to take me three or four years, because first of all, it's very expensive to live here while being a student, uh, an international or foreigner student. But also I wanted something that would be really like 
be hands on because I believe you don't need to go to film school. It's a great it's a great resource, but you don't have to go to film school. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of like for international people. And I know you have like a big part of the people that listen to this podcast are uh, not American people. So it is a great way going to film school for a year, for example, to get a degree in screenwriting, filmmaking, whatever it is gives you the possibility to get an OPT, which is a, a visa that allows you to then work a year here in the United States and file for an artist visa, which is what I'm currently doing. So it's a really great way to be able to establish yourself in the U.S. and work here legally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's great. I was thinking like two directors came to mind. First, uh, Michael Cimino, who also started in advertising, although directing yes. uh, commercials. And uh, the no need to go to film school, uh, quote, infamous quote by mm -hmm. Quentin Tarantino. Uh, yes. <laughs> so I think that yeah. I ahead. think that marketing is a is is a really you know advertising and marketing. I think Shonda Rhimes had a career in advertising too. Um, is a great way because it teaches you how to respect deadlines because you have very tight deadlines in, in advertising. Mm -hmm. So it really and like storytelling is something that you build already in advertising because um, every successful ads have like you know something compelling behind them. So I think it's a great way to then you know slowly make a shift into fiction or nonfiction. Um, and definitely about film school, it is not a necessity, but it can teach you, it can teach you a lot, obviously. Um, and it teaches you deadlines and it teaches you, you know, uh, mm -hmm. dealing with feedback, which is such an important part of this industry, getting feedback, giving feedback. So it does have great things, you know, but you don't need it to make it in the industry mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, just a bit, that, that, that's fantastic. I mean, uh, you mentioned the initial exposure uh, to, to Hollywood via, via movies and TV shows. Yeah. What was, um, we'll get to the most influential screenplays uh, later on, I guess. Uh, but <laughs> what was the, I, I mean, the show or movie that really like struck an impact and made you at least start to write or go from novels into, uh, into the screenplay? So I love uh, Thelma and Louise. I have such a deep love for that movie. For I think that when you put it back in the con in the you know in the back in the days, that was such a huge thing. Those two chicks going on a road trip and and you know murdering someone and like it was just huge. And those two girls are just they're such compelling characters and they're so badass and their story arc you know it's just fantastic. So I have such a deep love for that movie and I think I, I'm very lucky because. I have um, a mom who always like, you know, put me in that like those great movies from the 80s and 90s. She made me watch all of them, especially the thrillers. I have so much love for like, you know, movies like The Hand That Rocked the, the Cradle, um, Indecent Proposal, like all those um, basic instinct. Those, I think those are amazing <laughs> movies. And, you know, it's a very different storytelling than now because they used to take so much more time to set up the story in act one. And today people are like, there's so much content that they don't have the time anymore to like really dive as much in movies than they used to. But I think those are fantastic movies. And, and she made me watch all of them, which is amazing. Just like she made me listen to all the music from back, back in the day. So I, I'm really lucky to have that, that, I guess. So I would say that that's pretty much what really made me want to write movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tell and Louise, uh, you know, actually, it was a flaw in my CV. I, I watched it for the first time last year, and I really did enjoy <laughs> it, uh, as, especially uh, not only the performances by Susan Sarandon and uh, Gina Davis, uh, but also the soundtrack. Uh, I was like, yes. really, wow. Um, it was yes, a great exactly. movie. And, and still, I mean, it uh, obviously, uh, the acting and the screenwriting takes a lot of uh, credit for the, the movie's success, but I think it's also a tribute to Ridley Scott's um, versatility, you know, the ability to go yeah. from his more uh, niche productions uh, in sci-fi or adventure into something uh, very different. But yeah, yeah. definitely a, a great... That also, shows you, yeah. that also shows you how, you know, you don't need, and we're going to talk about that um, at some point in this podcast, I guess. You don't need to only write in one genre. Like, you can you can do more than one thing. And, and it doesn't, you don't have to be just one thing. You don't have to be just a comedy writer or an, you know, um, horror writer or whatever. Like, you can, you can do more than that. Write what you feel and what you're passionate about. Because that's what people will see on the paper, on the page. 
that's mm-hmm. it's a great uh, great suggestion. I have a couple of uh, friends who also do stand up comedy like me, or as a yeah. as a side gig, um, and they will be. Uh, I, I will mention this specific part to them so that they don't lose focus. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> Regarding, uh, I mean, obviously we we covered the influences. Then again, your uh, big hit or your latest hit, uh, what was the what's the show about? Uh, I've I've seen the posts. I'm very curious to hear what mm-hmm. was the 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 latest big project that you were involved in. So I would say the latest big project. Um, I have several things going on right now. Uh, luckily mm-hmm. for me, uh, even during this quarantine, it's been pretty busy. But I would say that the biggest project so far is uh, my TV show, the one that I sold. Um, mm-hmm. That's called Bonnie and Bonnie, which is probably the one you saw um, online. Yes. So that project is, you know, it started as a short film, which is uh, pretty interesting, I guess, because many, many often I see like, you know, writers being like, oh no, no short films. That's not something I'm interested in. But short films are actually an amazing medium to get your work out there and to get people to notice you. And, you know, a short film or just like any other, you know, a TV show or a movie, you need a three, uh, like obviously a movie has three X structure, a TV show five or six, but you need, you have that beginning, middle and an end too. And your end needs to be like a major twist usually. So I pretty much like created that short film as like a fun project, two girls stealing from a guy um, on a, on a, you know, dating Tinder app, whatever thingy. Um, mm-hmm. And it was a funny project. And and I had some people watching it and being like, oh, my God, this would be an amazing TV show. And I was like, oh, I've always wanted to write for TV. And I was like, interesting. I didn't think about it. So I started like brainstorming some ideas and I talked about it with um, a teacher at a film school who, who also become um, became my mentor. And mm-hmm. she loved the project and she really like pushed me to make the best out of it. She always made me believe you can sell, you can sell this. This was my first TV show, right? And, mm-hmm. you know, you have so many people telling you, you need to, you know, struggle for 10, 20 years in the industry before you sell anything, before anything happens. Mm-hmm. And that is, that does happen. That does happen. But that doesn't have to be your story. Every single path, every single story in Hollywood is different. There is no guide to success. Um, but you, your mindset makes such a big difference. I've always believed that I could sell that show because I had the right people around me and because I had people that, you know, encouraged me to do that. And I had the right, you know, I, I reached out to people, I created a network around me. Um, and I knew that this show was special um, because, you know, it has a lot of elements that um, were necessary today in Hollywood and, you know, a clear representation of LGBTQ relationships. And, mm-hmm. you know, uh, but that's not the center of the show because so many shows right now are, are you know, movies are have LGBTQ characters, but that's, the only thing about them. And here they're more like, they're almost, I'm very inspired by Thelma and Louise in this script actually, because those two girls are just, they're awesome and they're really cool and they're living that life and they're, they're flawed, they're deeply flawed. Um, and, but they're reliable, like relatable. You can actually see mm-hmm. yourself in this character for different reasons. Um, so I pretty much, um, how it happened for me is that I finished that show, I uh, finished I, did, I typed Fade Out, and six months later, I sold the show to a production company that has major credits. So <laughs> what happened, I got, I got lucky, I guess. Or maybe, you know, I just, I guess it's, it's a mix of, of doing certain things that I think everybody should be doing, which is network. Network like mm-hmm. crazy, just as good as your network. If you have a great story, but no one knows about it, then it's like having nothing. So mm-hmm. what I did um, right before graduating is going to the Fade In online uh, Pitch Fest something, I think that was the name of it, which is one that, so they do it online and they do it, um, you know, you can go physically to the place. Um, so I basically went to the one, you know, you have to go there and, and it was very impressive and, and <laughs> scary um, because, you know, you enter that beautiful hotel and there's about 500 other writers and everybody has <laughs> five minutes to pitch their project to, you know, producers that are there. So Netflix is going, there's, there's plenty of big names, you know, and big production company and studios going there. Um, and you basically wait in the, in the waiting room with those other writers. And it's, it's kind of sad too, because you just realize how many people want to be writers. Um, mm-hmm. So it's like, it's very, it's very, it really reminds you that there is many, many people out there that are working day and night to, to become this. So you really got to step up and do the same, like work as hard or harder. Um, so then you get, you get five minutes, you enter a room, there's about, I don't know, 20 people pitching at the same time and you sit, you know, at your table 
with that producer or that manager or that studio and you pitch your idea in five minutes. And what is, I would advise anyone to at least once do that. Uh, it might not bring you much and you might not sign something out of it, but the amazing thing that it teaches you is how to, first of all, be humble and also mm-hmm. how to really keep your pitches short um, because you do not have any extra minute. At the end of the five minutes, there is an alarm and everybody has to go out. If you're in the middle of your pitch, you don't get a chance at ending your pitch. So it's really stressful, and it's, but it's an amazing experience and it really makes you grow, I would say, as, as a writer and as a person too. Um, and it really teaches you a lot. So I've done that um, following this. I, so I networked with a lot of people there, uh, producers, but also other writers. And I reached out to people after that. And um, I got a production company that was interested in Bonnie and Bonnie. That was the project that I was pitching there back then. Um, and following that, um, I continued pitching around and, you know, used the network that I was starting to create to just reach out to more and more and more people. Uh, and I was playing my own manager. You know, they always say that you can't do anything without a manager or an agent, but that's not true. Um, definitely at the beginning of your career, it's harder when you don't have representation, but you can be your own manager or your own agent. The hardest is to get the first meeting. Once you get the first meeting, just pick up your phone, call everybody that's, you know, that production company's um, direct competitors and tell them you're going to pitch. And yeah. probably people are going to want to hear you too, because no one wants to miss out on the next great thing. No one wants to take that risk. So really, t- you know, take your phone and call. And, and that's what I did. And I started having all those meetings and eventually landed on, there was kind of like a bidding war between three companies. And I eventually chose the one that gave me the best contract. And that's who I signed with uh, six months after typing fade out for my first ever TV show written. Well, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I don't know how to, w- what to say because that's really, <laughs> no, it's really an impressive story. And uh, I think, like, I was just scribbling some notes o- along the, the lines of what you were saying. And uh, you mentioned three things. So basically the, the first one was, um, let's start with feedback, right? You you yeah. highlighted the importance of, of feedback. Uh, during the creation or during the creative process, um, did you have tons of like sources of feedback were you pretty much creating it in a silo uh what was the the whole uh, approach when it came to um, like to feedback checkpoints because it's easy to write a page and say oh is this good enough what do you think right so I I love that you asked that question because I think that is such an important point is that uh, and that's kind of like sometimes too what happens in film school it's like it feels cool. It's kind of like, you know, going to class every day naked because everybody's reading your pages <laughs> and like, you know how we all, this is us, this is our soul on the paper. And when you have everybody debating it, it's sometimes very hard because they often do it like pages by pages. So it's like, if you give me your script and I only can read 10 pages and give you notes on that, then it's sometimes frustrating because you have stuff that, you know, are going to pay off later. And you give me like, you know, you want sometimes people to give you feedback on the final product. So that's something that I learned. Like I protect my projects until fade out for the first draft because mm-hmm. I feel like if I'm give, getting feedback while I write it, often it kind of breaks my creative flow because, you know, there is so many notes out there and so many, everybody has an opinion, which is, which is amazing. Getting notes is amazing. But I also feel like the first draft is you telling yourself the story. And I believe that it is so important to have that with a first draft because often writers will get too many notes while they're writing the first draft and they get kind of get lost and they don't know what they want to say anymore. And then they end up, if they get to fade out, they end up with a project that's nothing like what they wanted to say. So I feel like give yourself as a writer, if it works for you, obviously, give yourself the opportunity to tell your, the story to yourself first in the first draft. And then, you know, send it to the people you trust and get like plenty of notes out of this. Now mm-hmm. about notes, um, there's also a time I found myself lost in the in the you know feedback sauce if I could say that like they were coming from everywhere um, and I kind of didn't know what to do anymore. So at some point when I was very new, I was applying every single note I got, and I realized that that's such a big mistake to do. Um, so what you should be doing, I feel like you should definitely address your notes when you get it more than at least twice. Because if two people have the same note or like misunderstood something, it means that there is high chance that more people will. So Mm -hmm. if you get a a note, like a feedback, like something's not exactly working in your script, like, you know, make the changes if you get it at least twice, if you get that note at least twice. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I would say any 
any note that excites you, make the change. If you get a note that's like, oh, that's such a great idea or whatever, whatever, then make the change. Even if it's like a once in a, like, you know, just a one-time note, it doesn't matter. As long as it excites you, that means you should write it. Um, and then be aware of the note behind the note. You might sometimes get, I, I know people hear that term, um, but there's, you know, sometimes you get a note and you don't exactly understand what that person wants. And sometimes there is a very, like, there is a note behind the note. They might be criticizing something about your character, but, you know, if you're in front of a producer and you don't exactly understand what's wrong with that character, ask that, try to understand and go around what exactly the point is. And sometimes it might be something like, oh yeah, actually that character, it would be better if that character is this way, this way, this way, because our our audience is like more so or so, and it's something related to, you know, something that's much deeper than your actual character. So always be aware of like the notes behind the notes um, when mm -hmm. you get feedback. Yeah, I think that's uh, something that's uh, that's very valuable. And uh, I think it's transversal or at least spans across multiple industries or regardless of what the yeah. job you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um, cool. The the second point, and uh, I, I think what, what uh, something you also wanted to talk about was actually okay. The the importance of networking crucial. We we get it. But you you also mentioned that um, first of all, there's always that misconception. Okay, if I'm not in LA, if I'm not pitching to the big guys, or even if I'm not entering the competitions or contests or events in a physical way. Um, I, I'm out. I'm out of the game, right? So, I mean, in terms yeah. of networking from afar, if there is such a thing, um, <laughs> the, the internet. I mean, is it that useful to? I mean, you can be part of a community, you can submit things online, but it's it's not the same thing. Uh, this is my at least my my theory, and I guess uh, a misconception maybe. What are your thoughts on on networking from afar? <laughs> So I do believe that things get easier when you're here because, you know, as, as I don't think it matters where you are when you're writing or when you're like, you know, doing that kind of stuff or entering contests. But as soon as you start pitching, um, often you're going to be asked, you know, in in person to enter the room. So it's much easier if you're in um, Hollywood, obviously. Now, however, right now with the times and, you know, COVID and the quarantine, no one's going in any room right now. So this is the perfect time to be pitching your projects because everybody's pitching on Zoom. So <laughs> what's going to be interesting to see is in the months to come, will this stay as a possibility for people to pitch on Zoom or will we all have to go back into rooms? There might be something that, you know, that is now open for writers to be able to pitch from afar this might be something, a trend that stays for the months to come or maybe even during like, you know, early 2021, who knows? Um, mm -hmm. So it will be interesting to follow if that has changed some things. Um, mm -hmm. Now I wouldn't, as a, as a writer, I wouldn't say, if I don't live in LA, I wouldn't mention it. Um, you know, I wouldn't tell them that I don't live in LA. I would, I would look as available as I possibly can. But obviously it can become a problem if you live in Europe and they want to see you tomorrow. <laughs> it might be a little <laughs> bit of an issue, but... Um, I think it's definitely more challenging, but I think there's plenty of opportunities out there. Um, there's definitely resources. Um, so as, as soon as you create your network, things get easier because you have people to go to when you pitch. But sure. before, I had, before I had my network, um, I remember doing stuff like, so for example, I would advise the people that listen to this podcast, take a look at the Pitch Fest, uh, but the online version of it, um, because mm -hmm. then you can just do it on Skype or, or Zoom. Uh, another thing that I think, I don't know if it still exists, but it used to back in the days, it's called VPF. I think the name, the full name is Virtual Pitch Fest, which this is mostly, you send a query letter to people that usually don't take queries. So I think it's a website that, you know, offers packages and you can pitch to certain companies and, you know, they tell you what kind of movies they're looking for and you can send your written pitch. That might lead to something. Um, there's also uh, Roadmap Writers that have uh, different opportunities that they offer and I would say that today, there's never been as many opportunities online. Uh, and even before the quarantine and, you know, everything that's happening right now, there is so mm. many opportunities out there. And I think that being European or, or being non-American on the Hollywood market is actually a plus now because they're looking for writers a little bit, you know, new writers and people that come from elsewhere and people that have different cultural backgrounds. So I think that today also to find representation, 
speaking more than one language or having a different cultural background or, you know, being part of a community like the LGBTQ community or, or you know, whatever community you're part of um, is something that is now more than ever um, valuable on the market. So mm-hmm. I, would, I would even, you know, mention that in front of a manager or an agent because they do want to represent those writers. Mm-hmm. No, it's a very valid point, and I think very encouraging for uh, aspiring uh, screenwriters uh, to not be discouraged and to actually take this as the opportunity. Because yes, yes. Uh, this actually changed uh, not only well every single industry, and I think the entertainment yeah. industry is no ex- no exception. But it's yes, very and good, I very think good it's going to be it's going to be really fascinating to see because this has opened. We just realized that we spend you know so much of our time physically into meetings so are we going to have more meetings online now and is because we realize that pitching on on zoom is perfectly fine i've done it and it works perfectly well so is it something that's going to stay as a thing uh, which would be really great for the people that don't live in hollywood um but right now if anyone's ready to pitch now is a perfect time because you can do it from anywhere in the world as long as you have wi-fi um mm-hmm. so we'll see i think that there's also going to be you know it's also interesting now are we going to have to change the way we write? Like, how is the world going to look once we, you know, pass this whole COVID-19, you know, situation? Like, how how is production going to look like? Is everybody going to have to stay quarantined for two weeks before they go on set? Like, because that's going to have, a, you know, budget-wise, that's going to be much more expensive than a production. So how is it going to be? How is the world going to look like exactly? And how are production going to start, you know, work again? Like, I think it's going to be fascinating time in any industry, but in Hollywood, very much so. Mm -hmm. Completely agree. I mean, I've been keeping track even, I think it was, so today is actually the 22nd of May, and I was just watching the, it was released here early in the morning, uh, the new Tenet trailer, right? So Mm -hmm. basically at the end, you just had in theaters and... uh, (laughs) <laughs> when, um, and I know Christopher Nolan has been pushing for the 17th of July, yeah. but uh, yeah, let's oh, that's, see. Yeah, let's, I, I doubt it here in LA, but who knows? But I love that you just told me it's the 22nd of May. I had no clue we were still in May. I completely lost track of time. I felt like no, we're no, no, no. but I'm glad. No. <laughs> No, no, the reason why I said this is because it's going to go uh, online uh, later and I didn't want, oh, the guy loves movies and like it yeah. took him two weeks to watch the trailer. Uh, so I don't <laughs> want to, to you know, yes, my, my, my cred, my sweet cred would go down the drain. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, covering. <laughs> the <laughs> other other of the, the three bits uh, that I wanted to mention or the, the, the last one would be um, from what you were mentioning, the, the creative process. And here, I think a few minutes ago, you mentioned the rule breaking approach. Uh, and I would really love to hear that because, you know, I read the book Save the Cat, etc., all the classics. Uh, I guess yeah. uh, you read even more. Um, but the thing is, like, it's always that traditional structure and there's always the um, perfect balance between, yes, I have a great story and that's the ego part talking, but also how the hell do I adapt it to the lingo? Therefore, I need to yeah. speak the same language and that requires the same old, same old structure. So you mentioned that break you had with rules, if you will. Uh, I would really love to hear more about it, like the the whole, not only the creative process, but how does that fit into not being stuck with rules? Yeah, so I do believe that you need to know the rules in order to break the rules anyway. And sometimes, you know, the the normal structure of a movie, the one that you, you know, is taught like in all those books, is it's a great one. I'm not saying that it's not, and I'm not saying that it doesn't work. Um, But I believe that as soon as you feel like a rule is limiting you in your storytelling and it doesn't feel organic the way you're telling the story anymore, then break that rule because it just follow what feels organic and what feels right to you. And there's chances that it's going to be exactly the structure that you learn in books because, you know, so many of them are that structure. But I also believe that you should really follow what feels organic to to you to write and the way it feels organic for you to write it. It doesn't matter if that one thing happens on page five and the other thing happens on page 37. The Mm -hmm. truth is if nothing happens in, you know, five pages, probably people are going to, you know, lose interest. So try to have something interesting every single page if you can, or at least every three or four pages and you're good. It doesn't have to be, oh my God, that one thing has to happen on page five. That other one thing has to happen on page seven. That is not exactly 
how this really works, I would say. So just try to go for what feels organic and what feels the right way to tell your story. Um, for other rules, um, I, I have heard a few, you know, there's so many books out there and I think that, you know, so many of them are amazing and, and great and you should, you should have a knowledge about it. But then there is also, I think I got into that mistake where in the beginning I was reading too many books and it kind of started being scary to even write because I was like, oh my God, there is so many rules and there's so many blah, 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 you know? And it's like, just, just at some point, read scripts and write because you're never going to learn as much from reading scripts. Um, and I know we're going to talk about this a little bit. So I would say just read a ton of scripts, know how to format your script because that's very important. Mm -hmm. uh, be aware of, you know, the grammar, even though, you know, it's okay if you have a few mistakes, but like be aware as much as you possibly can on your grammar. Um, and then just, you know, tell the story the way you feel like you want to see it on screen. Um, and, you know, there's, like you were saying, so there's, there's plenty of rules that I've heard either from, you know, social media, cause you know, so many people putting rules out there or, um, <laughs> from people at film school or, you know, other writers and yada, yada, yada. So one of them was, um, that I will always remember, uh, was you're not going to sell your first script. No one does. Um, so I would say. I don't know if it happens a lot and I don't know if I, I would be able to say, to give you names, but it is, you should, you should believe that you can. And I, I got lucky when I was writing Bonnie and Bonnie that I always believed I could sell it. And I always had people around me being like, yeah, this is your first TV show. So what? It doesn't like, you know, you know how to write um, and, you know, just make it, make it something amazing. So I always believed that I could sell my first TV pilot. Um, and, and I did. So I think that that's something that you, need to remember is that maybe it's not going to happen and, and don't despair if it doesn't, but there is no rule that should say that it, it shouldn't happen to you. Um, mm -hmm. And there's, you know, there is also that, that, that rule that says that you need to have at least three projects to attract anyone. And I believe that it's, you know, the more, the better, of course, but like, you know, you need to have quality over quantity too. But obviously if you just have one project, it's going to be harder to attract people like managers or agents, but I've never seen a producer care if you only had one project or not um when I sold Bonnie and Bonnie I still you know had only very few other projects that were not completely done I now have like six projects that are you know solid but my producers never asked me back then but obviously when I came back told them that I had other drafts like other you know scripts and projects they were interested in reading those too so obviously the more you have the better it is but for producers you don't need to have absolutely three projects that are this way and that way um and then the other aspect that I think is is still very present is that you need to write in only, you know, in the same genre. Um, if you started writing comedy, you should stick with comedy. If you started writing horror, you should stick with horror. Um, I believe that in TV, it's a little bit more true, maybe. Uh, and even then, you can, you can break the rule. But I think that in TV, there's that thing kind of like if you start to write hour long, then you, sh you usually stick with that. And if you start writing, you know, um, sitcoms, you stick with that. So... I think that's a little bit more common, but in, in films, there's plenty of writers that have mixed genre, and, and I think that's perfectly fine, and I do, I have, I have plenty of different genre, and there's never been an issue with that. Um, however, what I believe that writers should be doing is creating a brand. Um, have a very clear, there's, it's, it's pretty much impossible that there is nothing that links your different scripts. There's probably a theme that you often explore. There's probably a type of characters that you often explore. So make sure that you create a brand for yourself, like kind of like a writer's logline that just kind of says who you are in two or three sentences and what your writing is focusing on. And then it doesn't matter what kind of you know genre it is. People will know that you're the person to go to for that type of character, that type of character arc or that type of theme. So I would make sure to really take my scripts and, and take a look at what type of genre do I like? What type of, of theme do I like to explore? And mm. then, you know, that is your brand as a writer. And that is very important. Um, and then, you know, there's stuff like I was telling before is that you can't do anything if you don't have a manager or an agent. Um, and it's true that man a good manager or a good agent will bring you further. But it will open more doors for you, obviously. But, um, you know, when you start, play your own manager, pick up the phone, talk to people, let them know you're pitching. Um, talk on social media, let people know what you're doing, have your name as much as you can out there. And the more your name comes out, the more people are going to be intrigued and be like, oh, that person is pretty much everywhere. What, what is that person about? So, mm -hmm. you know, really play your own manager. That is a very important part 
before waiting that anyone else does it for you because no one wants you to succeed as much as yourself so you're always going to be the best manager for yourself um and you know that's that's mostly like some of the rules i'm thinking about i don't know if you're thinking about any any other ones um uh, well actually i was thinking about something you you mentioned in the beginning and it kind of stuck with me because usually i mean Uh, there's always that split between dialogue and, uh, you know, getting the log line, get, getting everything together, getting a structure, getting a story, right? And yeah. then comes the dialogue. And uh, I think maybe I've been reading the wrong books, uh, but, <laughs> but um, it's always, it, it's not an afterthought, but it's always sort of represented differently, yes. right? So it's always... Uh, get the story, I get it, and then the dialogue flows, or then you sort of hammer it. And I, I mean, I've always had a difficult time, I'm not a screenwriter, but I, I always had a very difficult time understanding, like, how can you make that distinction? Because if you're creating mm -hmm. something, if you're creating a story, if you're creating characters, there's dialogue, they have something to say, they yeah. have to react, etc. So, I mean, from a professional perspective, how do you manage that? Because you mentioned uh, uh, bits of dialogue that you were really excited about or some advice yes. or something like that. So how does that really work? <laughs> how do the two so, components work? So I personally try to not overthink that part. And, and you know, it's really funny because the more we speak about rules, the more I'm like, oh dear, <laughs> oh dear. You know, it's like there's so many out there that it's almost like you feel like if you really listen to all the rules, you feel like you're doing everything wrong. Uh -huh. Because So it's really what works for you as a writer. I personally think that dialogue is so important. Um, and I think there is, you know, there's that, that thing where everybody says, show, don't tell. And I absolutely understand and agree with that note, but I also think that it's a dangerous thing to say. Because that almost, you know, for some people, that means dialogue is not important, just show everything. And that is not the case at all. Dialogue is, is so important because that is such a big part of any movie or show you watch. So especially in TV, TV is very dialogue driven, much more so than, than film. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, dialogue is, is, is absolutely important. And for me, in my case, I realized that often for me, everything starts from characters. Um, you know, I've learned from people like Scott Myers, who's such a brilliant person. Um, and I've really learned how to come with my stories like from a, a character perspective first because and that's that's in film and tv but especially tv again people might come in and watch the first episode for the world you created or for the story but they're only going to come back for the characters so for me it always starts with characters i i kind of and that's going to sound super creepy um i kind of like make my characters Like I pretend they're alive and, you know, I have those exercises that Scott taught me where like you speak to your characters and it's super creepy. And the first time he told me to speak to my characters, I was like, hell to the no, I'm not going to be that one person who does that stuff. So I was like, hell no. Um, and he was like, just give it a try. And I was like, mm, I don't want to do it, but okay. So it's a very weird thing. Like, you know, you, 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 and you can try this at home. It's no danger, but don't ever do it in public because people are going to be crazy. <laughs> Um, so, you know, you, you basically sit at your computer and you type a scene, a scene, for example, where, you know, you could play, you in the scene play the psychologist and you pretend that your character comes in the room and tells you everything about them. So it sounds weird and awkward and that's obviously not a scene that's going to make it in your movie or your TV show, but speak to your characters and there's going to be something amazing if you're open to it, obviously. And if you're not, I don't judge you, I know it's weird, um, but, you know, just there's something magical about you know, talking to your character and asking them questions. And you should type all of that stuff. And you're going to realize that at some point, you're going to feel like they're answering you. <laughs> um, and that, you know, they're giving you details about them. Stuff that obviously comes from you. I know they don't exist. I know they're not, you know, real. Or aren't they? Maybe they are. No, like, you know, it's like, you know, that obviously comes from you. But the brain is such a fascinating tool. And there's stuff that might come to you creatively that you didn't expect before asking those questions and really imagining yourself in the room with that character, being their uh -huh. lawyer, being their psychologist, whatever the fuck you want to be. Um, I don't know if I can curse on this, so sorry. I just it's did. fine. It's um, fine. I'll link with explicit you know. content for this one. <laughs> but, but, PG-13. Yeah, just, yes, just that, like, you know, speak to your characters. And I know it sounds crazy, but it actually is a brilliant way to learn, to, to learn more about your characters. Um, and... Yeah, for me, like, I, I also realize when I get excited about an idea, I already hear dialogue in my head. 
I'm very much so like I see the story, but I already hear what the character is going to say. I hear specific voices in my head. Um, they're probably going to come and arrest me and get me like in a mental institute right now because <laughs> what I'm telling you is super weird. But like, you know, I really like hear, you know, w like those voices in my head already. And I, and I hear like, oh my God, there's such a cool line of dialogue. And I write them in my phone and I write them in my computer. So for me, it really mixes like the story is important, obviously, but the dialogue is such a big part. And, and, you know, famous films and TV shows, what people quote is usually not the story. They talk about a line of dialogue and there's so yes. there's amazing lines of dialogues out there and and read as many as you can get inspired don't steal um but get inspired by other lines of dialogues and and i would say another thing that you know we're in a world when, when we're when we're outside or we're in a train station or we're you know walking around before covid19 we <laughs> used to listen to music all the time like you know you everybody has their music plugged in their ears and whatever us writers try not to do that try to sit next to someone and listen to their conversation. And I know we shouldn't listen to people's conversations. It's rude, but listen to how people speak, listen to how people, you know, the pace of someone speaking, um, listen to how, you know, the words people use. And you would be amazed by how many great lines of dialogues you can um, get from people in the trains, like, you know, in the train or in the bus or in a bar. Um, and mm -hmm. you can use those because that is not stealing. So I would say, do that. Be more aware of the world around you. I yeah, I mean, to 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 your point, um, I'm I'm not saying like I would end, I would envision myself if I started to do that uh, and Sunset Boulevard wearing a cardboard <laughs> uh, sandwich, uh, saying the end is nigh. No, um, but it's actually I I don't think it's that much of a stretch when it comes to that exercise because at the end of the yeah. day you're trying to create something and if you yes. become immersed, I mean. It's not <laughs> nothing psychological. It's just that you're immersed and you you're putting a part of yourself yeah. in it, right? So yeah. at the end of the day, I don't really see that much of a stretch. Just to put your mind at ease. But it's funny you mentioned just to Thank pay attention you. to you. No, 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 it's fine. It's a. Uh, <laughs> um, I was actually in a pub here in London. I think a couple of months ago, waiting for a friend. And um, I heard this uh, this bloke pitching uh, his short movie idea to to another to his friend. <laughs> oh, I mean, I don't know if that's one of those moments where you think, "Wow, uh, I could do I could do better." Uh, but it was it, no, it, it was really like uh, uh, you know a dystopia. But then this happens, and then and you could really see like, man, that's like you're stealing. That's an exact copy <laughs> of Escape from New York. John Carp John Carpenter's Escape from New York meets whatever. Oh, yeah. Um, and I was just listening to that fascinating. My friend arrived and I was like in a Zen state, you know, just like yeah. sh absorbing. No, I want to hear how this ends because like uh, does the character have an eye patch and it's called Snake Pliskin? I don't know. <laughs> um, maybe it does. Um, but, but it's fantastic. Uh, like to your point. Yes, I've tried that. And uh, this was the, the sort of uh, the, the result. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, and like, but like, definitely listen because you might get ideas for movies, or you might yeah. hear other people pitch and stuff. But you also will hear how people speak. We all speak differently, and we all speak like you know at different pace. And often, a note I hear, especially for new writers, is that all their characters sound the same. So mm -hmm. a way to avoid that kind of stuff is like to really go out there and listen how people speak, because all of us use different words, and all of us use different you know little. We all have different ways of speaking. So being more aware of that definitely will help you in your in your writing for sure mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no i completely agree um i think still one of the points you mentioned that you would love to cover uh, i we talked about it uh, a bit which was the um, you know non non-american uh, writer and english not being your native tongue and yes. um you i think you wanted to leave a message to to address or to put put the mind at ease in terms of uh, people who are concerned about it obviously you mentioned yes. grammar is important and nowadays mm -hmm. with grammarly and other apps i'm not sponsored by the way but uh, similar <laughs> apps that you can find online it's yeah. easy to minimize the risk right so Absolutely. i know you wanted to cover that topic so I'm giving you the, the chance to do it now. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. That's actually like a really important point for me, um, indeed. And I don't always mention it because I often speak to like, you know, um, a native um, English speaking audience. So I usually don't have to really mention that because they don't connect to that, you know, issue. It's not really an issue, but th to that fact. Um, so that's something when I when I came here um, in L.A., I my English was already 
pretty good and you know my writing was already pretty good but you know the more you write the get the better you get at it anyway um so I remember that very early on when you know some could happen from some teacher or for some people from the industry were like oh it's going to be so much harder because it's already so hard for native people um to write you know in their own language so for someone who is not a native that is going to be mm-hmm. nearly impossible and that was for me so like I really struggled <laughs> with that and I really I really suffered from it I'm not gonna lie because I was like what the heck am I doing? Why don't I just go to Paris and then, you know, write in French and make a career there because it's going to be so much easier um, because I, that's my first language and, you know, all that stuff. And I I had had a moment where I was like, maybe I should just go home and, you know, fuck that. And, and you know, that's just, it's never going to happen for me because it's not my first language. Um, and that is something that is, I, I feel like people telling that stuff is extremely dangerous and hurtful to writers because, the truth is, like I was telling you earlier, being able to write, to speak or write in more than one language and having more than one cultural background is an amazing tool to use in storytelling. It's amazing to be able to, you know, bring that cultural thing in your scripts. Um, so I would say it's more so an amazing thing that you have more than one background. And if, you know, you only learn English pretty late, um, just make sure you get good at it and you, you know, your writing is good and your speaking is good. Um, and you know, you might sometimes make some mistakes that native people might not do. So there is plenty of, you know, people out there that, that are going to proofread your projects and make sure that there is no grammatical mistakes or, you know, that like, once you have good friends or people around you that, you know, could do that for you, that's amazing. If you don't have that, you can pay people to do it for you too. And that is something that if it's not your first language and you do struggle with that, I would advise people to do that because you don't want, you know, you do not want people that read your script to um, get, stop reading because there's too much grammatical problems or because the way you word stuff really sounds like clunky because that's not your first language. So I would say take a look at the proofreader or have friends around you that are really good at it. There's plenty of people that are native that don't write well at all. So make sure <laughs> that you don't just give your script to the first uh, English speaking person you find. Uh, but, you know, have like, make sure you know people that write well and that have, you know, a real uh, grammatical, like that are on point with their grammar. Um, and those people will give you, give it a read and, and make those little corrections. And it's very easy to correct that. What is hard is to come up with a great story and and have you know that storytelling instinct that stuff is hard if you have it then it doesn't matter if this is your first language or not um it's going to be harder in the beginning because you have to you know get used to writing in english but you know the more you do it the better you get at it i see right now for me that's just so natural because i wrote so many scripts in english so I write, you know, this is like I'm writing in French. It doesn't matter anymore. But I remember very early on in the beginning, it was something that I had to get used to um, because it wasn't my first language. Uh, And I was okay at it. I was good at it. But I wasn't as good as I am now and as good as I wanted to be. So really don't let that stop you um, from achieving, you know, from making it on this market. And if you grew up with, you know, the Hollywood TV and film, you know this market and you know what this market is looking for. And you even have the possibility to be on both markets. I think that in the years to come, more and more people are going to want to have writers that are international, that are capable to do stuff on the European market, which is a gigantic market. You were talking about Germany earlier. Um, We're Mm -hmm. talking about, you know, obviously London. Um, There is plenty like the um, uh, north of Europe is amazing for TV shows. We've seen that in the past years with amazing shows. So Mm -hmm. I think that the possibility to be on both markets is now absolutely amazing. So use this. Use the fact that maybe you're not American or maybe, you know, English is not your first language or maybe like at at your advantage. But make sure Mm -hmm. to get, you know, to be good at it and to practice and to have people proofread you if you don't feel comfortable with your writing. That's a very solid advice. (laughs) Always seeking. uh, What matters matters is stories. What matters is your stories. And don't ever forget what you're selling Mm -hmm. when you're entering a room is not just your script. You're selling yourself. So when you Mm -hmm. enter any room, it doesn't matter what market you're on. When you enter a room, never forget that what matters the most is the type of person you are. Because anything like making a film, making a TV show, this is going to take months, years um, of working with those people closely day by day. So no one wants to work with an asshole. So never forget that, you know, the human you are matters probably before anything else. 
Mm-hmm. I think the the asshole bit comes after the awards and the box office results. Uh, it's <laughs> it's earned. It's earned. Not uh, yeah, uh, right. Absolutely. <laughs> Once you make it big, you know what? You want to be an asshole. <laughs> no, uh, I mean, obviously, try to never be an asshole. That always helps. Yeah. Um, but, you know, people tend to sometimes become that once they have a lot of awards, fortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah I get it. <laughs> I have two additional questions for you. But yes. um, uh, before that, any other advice that we haven't covered yet that you would love to share with the audience? Um, I would say, you know, some some things to never forget is that you know there is no such thing as no um always remember that you can always turn a no into a yes um if you're sending your script out there and you know people like your writing but they might you know the producer might not have a spot for that specific story right now never just close the door being like thank you okay bye always leave it open and be like thank you so much for giving it a read like you know be thankful for that and also let them know I have some other projects. Maybe I could send you some, you know, would you be open for me sending you some log lines in the future? And most people, if they like your writing and if they appreciate you as a person, are going to say yes. If they don't, then they're assholes. Like people are not going <laughs> to say no to you sending log lines. So always keep, you know, what is important is not to sell that one project, is the connection, is the is keeping a connection with those people, is is having a network around you. You're just as good as your network. So never forget to Because I know I hear, I hear that thing sometimes, write an amazing script and people are going to come and find you. That is not completely true. Um, write an amazing script, network your ass off, make sure people know that you have an amazing script, get into, you know, go into contests and make stuff like that, and then people are going to come and find you. But your network, mm-hmm. you know, I think 95% of the people that get staffed in TV is through their connections. So really make sure that you create a network that is solid and, you know, in order to have a network that is solid, you need to give and not just take. So make sure that, you know, you can keep these people in the loop and, you know, see what you can do for them too. And, and it's a, it's a relationship and be very honest with, with the people, be genuine, like really want to create a relationship with them, not just use them for your personal benefit. Um, mm-hmm. Another thing that is also something that I think is so important is the power of scheduling. Um, you cannot go in any direction if you don't know where you're going. So always make sure that I, that's something that I feel like I've had the most success when I'm doing actively scheduling. Like I have, you know, I obviously have like a five-year goal, but then I have a one-year goal and then I have like a monthly goal and then I have like a weekly and then daily. And I know every single step I make every single day, I know towards what. And that helps me stay focused. That helps me stay motivated. And that really helps me achieve goals faster because I know exactly where I'm going. So I would say really take the time to schedule. Um, and, you know, then there's different things you're going to, that, that might happen to you or not. There's the, the thing that I'm sometimes struggling with because I sold the show very fast and I have several, currently several scripts that are like, you know, um, in, the, in the hands of top agencies here and, and, you know, producers and different projects, features and TV pilots that, you know, have gained interest. So there's a lot of things happening. And I think that that is, that is great if you can have more than one push more than one project at once because sometimes this industry feel like everything's happening at the same time and sometimes nothing's happening. So if mm-hmm. you have more than one project out there, you're sure that you're always going to have something on the go. Um, and sure. what might happen to you and don't let that ruin you because that is such a strong thing. You might feel like you might struggle from the imp- uh, imposter syndrome. You might feel like, Oh my God, I didn't, you know, I, I sold something pretty fast and this is happening and this is happening and I'm working so hard, but everybody telling me that, you know, this has to, you know, you have to struggle for 20 years before anything happens. And why did it happen so fast? Do I deserve this? Yada, yada, yada. Yes, you do deserve <laughs> that. Everybody's struggling in their different, in different ways. Um, other people's struggle is not your struggle. That is their stories. There is no path to success and just be thankful, be, you know, work hard and, and, you're good enough. You're good enough. And don't give up. People that make it in, the, in this industry are people that did not give up. Um, and, you know, if your name keeps popping, people will start, like, you know, getting interested in you. So really talk about what you're doing. Connect with other writers. Other writers are not your competition. Connect with other writers. Like, have a writer's room. Do stuff like that. And, 
you know, when you when you're starting, I know that some people have, you know, financial um, situations that are like kind of complicated. So when you're starting, you don't need to have final draft in the beginning. You can use something like Celtics. At least back in the days, it was free. I hope it's still free um, until you either can pay for a final draft or either feel like, oh, this is going to be something I'm going to give a shot at. So I'm just going to, you know, pay for that software. Um, I know students mm-hmm. usually have special mm-hmm. prices. So like keep an eye out for like special prices and and all that stuff and just never give up write a lot of stories and start being like train yourself to come up with one idea a day even if it's shit it doesn't matter just because what you want to achieve is become um an idea machine Mm -hmm. because too often i see people that have one script and that's their whole life and that's the only thing they're going to ever push so if anything happens they're destroyed because they lost their one thing don't Mm -hmm. be that person don't be that one thing like have always more than one thing out there because that is you're going to become an idea machine and you're going to love all your projects, but you're going to become less attached in the way like, oh, this didn't happen. It's okay. I have plenty of other things happening. So really train yourself in that regards. Mm -hmm. I think it's very solid advice. Um, It's always a bit, you know, focus on one thing, don't focus on too many, but it's, I guess it's, it's, it's a balance. Like you, like you pointed out, you need to, that's really up to the person uh, to really combine the, the ideas. Absolutely. There's some, I, I personally love to write on more than one thing. If I only write one script at a time, I go crazy. I like to have more than one script on the going, but I know other writers that cannot do that. And that's perfectly fine. Um, make sure that you push more than one project at a time. But if you need to write only one at a time, that is perfectly fine. Like everybody has their own, you know, way of doing it. And same with like prep, how much prep you put into a project. Some people outline like crazy. Other people just kind of outline and kind of know Whatever works for you is the way you should go about it. There is no rules about that. Is whatever yeah. works for you, do it. I think solid advice for many, many things, not only screenwriting. Uh, and I, I mean, that's true. I mean, uh, I was just talking to a friend the other day and he was telling me, I asked him how many books was he reading at the same time? I said, well, one more technical business the other one fiction and I was like okay yeah, I still wouldn't be I still wouldn't be able like okay it's two different things it's fair enough yeah but I, I wouldn't be able to uh to do that but again people do it and yeah. at the end of the day you read the book that's the point yeah uh so so I completely completely get it uh so my two questions and they're a bit like one of them we we already sort of uh, uh mentioned in our our first intro um we The second one is actually something you mentioned in the beginning that made me curious to hear your opinion. The the first one would be as a screenwriter and as a professional screenwriter, I mean, what are the we we talked about the shows and 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 movies, but again, the if you had to mention one or two screenplays that you think, wow, uh, I mean, beyond the story, the the structure, dialogue, everything combined, like that yeah. thing on its own, it's a yeah. p- masterpiece. What would it be? So I think that a point that I actually wanted to address that I think is really important is that I'm going to cite some, you know, movies that are obviously and shows that are known that I read the script of that I think the script is amazing. But I found myself recently, like in the past year, mostly read unproduced scripts from Uh um, from the blacklist, from the hit list, from the red list. It's Bonnie and Bonnie's on the red list, so you can request it too. Um, so it's, you know, the red list is the best um, TV shows out there, um, but it's also like, you know, um, films um, that, you know, are in, in development or unproduced or whatever. The blacklist is, you know, the best scripts that are currently, that's only for film, that are mm-hmm. currently, you know, um, shopped around town, but that are not produced. And the hit list is the new talent, upcoming talents, and their uh, spec scripts. So I would... I feel like personally, I learn much more from from reading those uniquely because I know who wrote it, how many drafts it's on approximately, and you know <laughs> that there is no other writers that came in and rewrote it. Because the problem that I find myself like seeing sometimes with those like already produced scripts is that you don't know how many writers came in and rewrote it. You don't know how you know what kind of, like is this like the 50th like draft of this, like you don't really know exactly, you can't track it as well. Yes. So I think that if you really want to learn how to write spec scripts, which you're going to do in the beginning, because when you start your career, there's not that many chances that people are going to out of the blue pay you to write a script. So when that, you know, before that, you're going to write spec scripts. So p- no one's going to pay you. And it's amazing because you actually get so much freedom to do whatever you want uh, because it's your spec script. 
So you really like read those and, and make sure you can request them with, with internet today. You can find stuff everywhere. So mm -hmm. just try to find them, Google it, like the hit list any single year, the blacklist every single year, the red list, and just find those scripts and read them because that is something you can aim for because that is another writer who, you know, wrote a spec script and, and it's on a few drafts, but you can track that. So you can really learn from that. So I would advise people to read it. And I personally have learned the most from reading those scripts. Um, now I feel like there's a few scripts that I really love and feel like are special for a different reason. Um, I remember the script of A uh, Quiet Place. Um, and I think there's something about that script that is really fascinating is that it barely has any dialogue because obviously, you know, if they speak or make any noise, they're yes. you know, being eaten by those horrible monsters. So um, I think the way this, this script is written, it's like, it's fascinating because I know many writers and sometimes I have that too where it's like you need the dialogue to kind of like make it entertaining so that script shows you that you can write amazing action lines that are like you know really entertaining and that you don't need a lot of dialogue to support that dialogue is always a great addition but this movie cannot have dialogue so how they show that they made it was amazing and they also if I remember well broke a rule um that is you know they at some point Kill the cat. They, <laughs> kill the cats yeah at some point there's like there's like um a countdown you know and if i remember well it was that script where like you turn the page and you have a big one you turn the page you have a big two you turn the page you have a big three and that's a countdown so you count with them um and i don't see any you know that's not usually something you're like oh let's use a full a page of the script and write a gigantic one because you're counting down up to three so i feel like that is something that I remember. And I think it was that script, I'm pretty sure, that was, mm -hmm. I thought, absolutely fascinating. Because I'm like, oh, I never saw that in any screenwriting books. That's pretty pretty cool, you know? And I think that's that's something, like, following that stuff, I started making my scripts, like, a little more fun, too. And, like, oh, I'm going to do something like that. And it's going to be something that people you don't usually see. Or I like to speak to my audience, for example. If I write something extremely ironic, or or and I know the writer, the reader is going to think something, I already address it. And I like to speak to my to my reader and I try to not overdo it, obviously. But if you do it a few times here and there, it can be something that people really appreciate. Um, have you read A Quiet Place? Uh, I haven't. Uh, it's now actually I wrote it down. I, I've seen the movie. I haven't read the screenplay. I read from the blacklist, the unproduced movie, that satire they wanted to make uh, Reagan about Ronald Reagan mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. dementia. Will Ferrell was associated with the project, but for obvious reasons, yeah. they didn't go along. And I actually read that um, that screenplay. Uh, so, and I, I, again, it's a very good source, uh, as you, as yeah. you pointed out, because it's unmade. So it requires you yeah. to actually, uh, it's a different type of exercise, I would say, but definitely a quiet place is now uh, made me think like, yes, that's actually very, a very, uh, good reading. Yeah. It's something that really, you know, I mean, like we said earlier, I do believe the dialogue is very important, but like that also shows that you can have a full movie that barely has any dialogue and it's an amazing read. Um, another another movie that I love the movie and I think the script is amazing too is the movie Her, um, mm -hmm. and I I find it, I find this one fascinating not not only in the script itself but I think that I know that if I came up with that idea I would feel like there is no way this is going to be interesting enough and then you watch the movie and this is a fascinating movie and you read the script and it's a fascinating script but you're like this the script is mostly between a man and his device it's mostly between you know a man and his ai so it's like how how is that you know it's yeah. fascinating that this is so interesting and like and like because you feel like it's only two characters kind of one you can't even really see um and you're like how do you make this an interesting story um and this one is much more you know heavier on dialogue obviously but it's 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 a fascinating script and and that also shows you that sometimes simplicity is the best remedy so I think that that is definitely um, a script that's worth like you know checking out. I don't know if you read it yet, but that's no, definitely... no, no, no. And 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 now I'm actually thinking about reading uh, Under the Skin. You know the Scarlett Johansson movie from 2014, with also yes. which also visually astonishing, but minimal yeah. dialogue. Right? I think probably yeah. what three lines of dialogue throughout the whole movie. I, I don't recall. Yeah. But um, yeah. Uh, so to your point, I mean, I would make a double reading session with the quiet place and under the skin 
you're gonna have a busy weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also yeah. I'm also advi- like I think American Beauty. I haven't read it in so long, but it was a great script. What I love is I think it has one of the best hook that you know. I don't know if you've ever heard <laughs> another rule where people are like VO voiceover is lazy. I highly disagree. I think there's amazing stuff out there. I think it depends why you use the VO. I think there's, yeah. if you use VO because you're like, oh, I don't know how to explain this other way. Like, I'm just going to use VO. That's lazy. But if you have a real reason behind doing it, I think then you can have amazing storytelling, like possibilities. And I think that American Beauty, it literally starts in the first pages with that VO of, you know, Lester. And mm-hmm. I think he says like something like, my name is Lester Burnham. Um, that's my neighborhood. This is my life. I'm 40 something, and in less than a year, I'll be dead. Mm-hmm. And and you're like, what the fuck? And it's like, and of course, I don't know that yet, but somehow I'm dead already, or something like that. He says, yeah. and then you follow that story of that guy, and such a, a sad, like, like you know, he's bored in his life and and all that stuff. But you like, you can go to all the bits of this movie because you know that at some point that guy is going to die. So like, it's an amazing hook. That like if you didn't have that hook in the beginning of American Beauty, I don't know if you would follow the whole thing or if you would get maybe bored at some point. But knowing that there's that big like thing that's going to hit at some point, it's mm-hmm. it's an amazing hook. And I think the, um, there's also that show that I think the pilot is great. Um, and the the show in general is really great. Uh, is the show You that's on Netflix? Mm-hmm. And I think that one same like it used the VO in such a brilliant way. Um, and, you know, I think that's 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 something that really shows you that there is no such thing as, you know, VO being lazy if you know why you're using it. Um, yes. And I think that, you know, people should watch when it comes to t- TV, people should watch a, a ton of pilots and read a ton of pilots because you learn much more from watching plenty of pilots and reading plenty of pilots than watching, you know, the first episode, then the second one, then the third one, then the fourth one. So I think that, you know, if you can just watch a new pilot every two or three days, you're going to learn so much. Um, mm-hmm. so yeah and, and everything I love Shonda Rhimes writing I think her pilots are amazing the way she introduces characters is amazing her dialogues is amazing <laughs> um, so all that stuff um, I would definitely you know take a look at and and like I was saying you're going to learn from everything that's there's amazing um, um, scripts out there that have been produced and you probably know many more than I do and read many more than I did but I love to write to read um the unproduced ones, because I think that is something that is so much more attainable for writers um, because you see, you can track how, you know, the story is told and, and you can see how the market is too. What are people looking for? What are people enjoying to read? So I would really take a look at all those blacklists, hit lists, red lists, all those lists out there. Mm-hmm. As a, an inspiration source and also a fuel of the yeah. market. And, and that's actually the the question, uh, the surprise question I have for you, which what? is <laughs> <laughs> now considering the, um, you know, I was actually having this conversation with somebody from the, well, industry that has a advertising background as well here in London. Yeah. And uh, he was talking about or expressing like his um, views on what kind of content will people want to see or will be produced in the post-COVID uh, era, or even in in the very near future, and I mean, you mentioned um, several times like getting a pulse for the industry, the demand, what's there, what's not there, what's the what's unproduced, and well, if you could share uh, your opinions or your views on how, where do you think the um, what what where where's the appetite for which genre is it um something more along the lines of uh romantic comedies or feel good movies to overcome the bad times or is it more of uh the distrust and government will push for the type of movies we had in the 1970s such as the parallax view and network mm-hmm. um so i think that's like you know, it's very hard to know right now where this is going to go. And it's it's going to be it's going to be very fascinating, I think, for the industry to see how this is going to happen. What I would advise people is to stay away from writing a COVID-19 story. And not because <laughs> they're not because there's not going to like be interest for it, but everybody's doing this right now. So, yes. you know, that's kind of like what happens in the world is like everybody's going to do their take. If you want to do a COVID-19 story, then make sure to have a very original take on it that is going to make your story exist even without that COVID-19 element. But I would stay away from it because I don't exactly know how the world is going to recover from this and, you know, how people are going to recover from this. So um, 
A, you're going to find yourself on the market with, I don't know how many other thousands of scripts that are have the same subject. Um, yes. And B, I think that after this, because this has been such a global thing, there is definitely going to be a very big name uh, that is going to make a movie about it. And they're going to get greenlit because they're such a big name and it's going to be a big thing. Th that's going to happen. It's, it's nearly impossible that in the years to come, there's not a COVID-19 movie. But I think that um, what is going to be wanted, um, and it is right now, and it's going to be probably in the months and, and years to come, are going to are going to be like you said, um, those feel good movies. And I know rom coms are, are having like a, a comeback kind of like after this because that's you know rom coms tend to be comfort food. Is that thing you go back yes. to when you don't feel very well? Um, so th that's there's going to be probably more rom coms or like an, an open market. I've heard a producer say recently that all they're looking for is rom coms right now because they want to <laughs> offer that feel good. And, and that's great because rom-coms have kind of been like the dead thing lately. So I think the fact that they get a comeback is, is amazing. Um, and it makes sense because that's human psychology behind too, where it's like, when you don't feel well, you want to go back to something you know, and that feels like home. And rom-coms feel like home for most people. So mm -hmm. I think there's going to be, there's definitely going to be an openness to rom-coms. Um, and you know, I think that feel good movie or definitely like buddy movies, road trip movies are going to be stuff mm -hmm. that are going to be wanted. Um, and that's that's the kind of stuff I would, you know, think about writing right now. Now, however, if you have a story that is, you know, much darker and, and you want to tell it, tell it. You should always write what inspires you, because if you force yourself to write something that doesn't, it's going to be felt on the pages. So go for what inspires you. But it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see how, you know, how it's going to be after too, because there is chances that we're going to have to social distance for even once we're out of quarantine, that we're going to have to continue to social distance. So will that impact the amount of people you can have in a scene in a movie? Are we going to not be able to have like enormous scenes with like thousands of people anymore or not? That's all going to be questions that are going to come later. And I would say right now, when you write, write like COVID-19 did not exist. Right, like people don't social distance and all that stuff because we do not know what the world is going to look like. And you know, cool. just follow, yeah, just follow the theme that you know inspire you. But I would say for now, try to stay away if you can from COVID nineteen subjects. That's great because my uh, pitch, the pitch that I made to you about my cross between uh, Telma and Louise and one flew over the cuckoo's nest, uh, doesn't involve COVID nineteen. We still awesome. need. To <laughs> We, we, we still need to check Chevy Chase's, uh, you know, day rate, but uh, yes, pen, pending be, that, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. We're Lena, on it. We're going to get that produced. We're going to get it made. The dream lift. <laughs> Elena, yes, thank you absolutely. so much. Thank you thank so you. much that for was being here. I had so much fun. I had so much fun. I hope this is going to be, I know sometimes I speak a lot, so I hope this is going to be entertaining and interesting for the people listening to it. Um, it and be. feel free to share with as much people you know and can and, you know, I hope this is going to be uh, helpful. Thank you so much for having me. I really had a great time. It's a pleasure. And I hope, uh, okay, I, I'm not expecting a mention during the 2022 uh, Primetime Emmys, but, well, you know, if you can talk <laughs> my name will. around there, it's fine, it's fine. Uh, for sure, not, for not, sure. Not trying, not trying to get any recognition. Uh, thank you once again. I will, I will definitely, definitely mention you. Don't worry about Perfect. it. Perfect. <laughs>